please join me in welcoming David Brooks. I'm going to talk to you for about 25 minutes about community, and then we'll have a conversation. Uh, and I should say, talking about community, it's a little odd for me because I am a writer, so I work alone. Uh, when I was seven, I read a book called Paddington the Bear, if anybody's read that book. And I decided at that moment I wanted to become a writer. And I've been writing ever since. So like in high school, I wanted to date a woman named Bernice. And she didn't want to date me. She wanted to date some other guy. And I remember thinking, what is she thinking? I write way better than that guy. So <laughs> the values wouldn't have worked. Uh, and so then when I was 18, uh, the admissions officers at Wesley and Brown and Columbia decided I should go to the University of Chicago, uh, which is another <laughs> solitary, sort of bookish kind of place. They say of Chicago, it's where fun goes to die. Um, though the best thing about Chicago, it's a Baptist school where atheist professors teach Jewish students St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, so again, it was bookish, sort of solitary. I learned to certain skills at Chicago, like the ability to dominate classroom discussion while doing none of the reading. Uh, and then I graduated and became a pundit. Uh, and so I'm now, uh, I work on a show called The News Hour on PBS, which is again, sort of a heady show. Um, we have a certain demographic we go for. If a 93-year-old lady comes up to me in the airport, I know what she's going to say. I don't watch your show, but my mother loves it. <laughs> and so, um, so again, heady, a little solitary. Then I got a job as a conservative columnist at the New York Times, which is a job I likened to being the chief rabbi in Mecca. Uh, not a lot of company there all the time. Uh, and so you, you go off, and you're, you're leading sort of a bookish, solitary life. So as you get a little older, uh, you, um, I think most guys get a little more feminine as they get older. Uh, I'm the only male in America who read that book, Eat, Pray, Love. If anybody knows that book, I, by, by page 123, I was actually lactating, which was kind of amazing. Uh, then I wrote a book called The Social Animal, which was about emotion. Uh, my friends joked that me writing a book about emotion was like Gandhi writing a book about gluttony. Uh, it's not the natural thing. And then I wrote a book uh, a couple years ago called The Road to Character. And I learned writing that book that um, writing a book on character doesn't give you good character. And even reading a book on character doesn't give you good character. But buying a book on character does give you good character. So, <laughs> so all this to say, uh, my career has been somewhat solitary and kind of heady, cerebral. Uh, and yet, if we think about community and we think about ourselves, uh, the most important part of our consciousness is not our cerebral, rational mind. It's our desiring heart. I met a guy uh, who bought a house with a bamboo stand by the driveway, and the guy hated bamboo, and so he chopped it down, uh, and then he took an ax to the root system, and then he poured plant poison over what was left, and then he put three foot of gravel in the hole, and then he covered it over with cement. Uh, and two years later, a little green shoot of bamboo was sticking through the cement. And in my view, that's what we have inside of us. We have desire. We are existential sharks. We are always on the mood. We're always desiring something. And what the heart desires above all uh, is to be fused with other people, to be in community and to be in loving relationships, the kind of fusion that uh, Louis de Bernier captured in a book called Captain Corelli's Mandolin. Early in that book, he has a guy talking to his daughter about his relationship with his late wife. And the guy says, love itself is what is left over when being in love is burned away. And this is both an art and a fortunate accident. Your mother and I had it. We had roots that grew towards each other underground. And when all the pretty blossoms had fallen from our branches, we discovered that we were one tree and not two. And that's kind of the fusion that we dream of in a good marriage and sort of in a good community. We want to be bonded to each other. The second part of our consciousness is the yearning soul. Now, I don't ask you to believe in God or not believe in God. That's really not my department. I ask you to believe that there's a piece of you that has no weight, size, shape, or color, but gives you infinite dignity. Uh, and rich and successful people don't have more of this than poor or less successful people. Older people don't have more of it than younger people. And that slavery is wrong because it's an obliteration of another human being's soul. Sexual harassment is wrong not because it's an assault on a bunch of physical molecules, but because it, it obscures and insults another person's soul. And what this soul does is it yearns for righteousness. Everybody I've ever met wants to be a good person. 
I cover crime, I've covered wars, even people who commit ge genocide have some explanation for why what they did was good or at least excusable. They all want to be good. And we're all driven by that desire to be good. You're all in this room because you want to have a good community, you want to do something good for the, this place. And so I've noticed over the course of just interviewing, especially people over 50 or 60, is that their t life takes on a two mountain shape. They get out of school and they choose their career and they think that's my mountain. And they spend years climbing that mountain, building a family, building a job, building a life, establishing an identity. And then sometimes they achieve the success and it's not quite completely fulfilling. Or they fail, they get knocked off the mountain. Or uh, something terrible happens like the loss of a child and they get sent into the valley. And the weird thing about the valley is you can see better from the bottom. And then they decide, you know, that first mountain that I thought was my mountain in life, that wasn't actually my mountain. And the second mountain is, uh, that's actually my mountain. And sometimes they switch jobs, sometimes they start philanthropies or foundations, or I met a guy who was a banker in Tennessee, he quit that, he became a pastor, didn't like that, and now he's working with prisoners, helping them transition out of jail, and the guy is completely joyous. He's incandescent to talk to that guy. And so he's on his second mountain. And that we're driven to that second mountain by our, our desires and our yearning soul. And it's my view that the, the weird thing about the soul is it's super powerful, but super reclusive. You can go years really without thinking about it. You're building your family, you're doing your job. But I think there's a point in everybody's life, maybe toward middle age, where it comes out of the mountains and it's like a leopard that just comes out and sits there on the floor and asks you, what did you do with your life? What good have you done? Why were you called? What were you here for? And people who haven't thought about that question have to live with that fact. But most people come to think about that question one after another. And so we're desire built for community, for union with each other and union to serve a good. We've kind of been screwing up over the last few decades. And I'd like to describe different cultures that led in this country, across the country, to a loss of community. And my view is that culture is a collective response to the problems of the moment. And so between 1932 and 1968, this country faced a lot of big problems, the Depression, the World Wars, and they created a culture that was very collective, very group oriented. You had to work in big organizations, the Army, IBM, labor unions. And so they had a culture which you might call we're all in this together. And it was super collective. And so if you lived in, say, Chicago, you probably worked at the same Nabisco plant your dad and your granddad worked in. You joined the same union. If you lived in a neighborhood, you probably, there was no TV there, no air conditioning, so the kids were running through the homes in the summer and you were in each other's lives with barbecues and coffee clutches and babysitting cooperatives. Uh, if you, somebody asked you, where are you from? You didn't say, oh, I'm from Chicago. You said, I'm from 59th and Pulaski because it was that crossroad was the tight community where you lived. And so that was a very community-oriented culture we had then. It had a problem, of course. It was a culture that tolerated a lot of racism, a lot of sexism, a lot of anti-Semitism, a lot of emotional coldness. The food was really boring. <laughs> and it just wasn't creative. And so around about 1962, people said, you know, we're gonna break, we gotta break out of this. It's just too conformist. And so they walked away from the community and they created a culture that was super individualistic. And the transition moment that I think of was one of the highlights of my childhood was Super Bowl III. Super Bowl III, there were two quarterbacks on the field, both of whom were born in Western Pennsylvania, but 10 years apart. On the side of the ball turbo culture there was a guy named Johnny Unitas, typical 1950s guy, crew cuts, wore high top shoes, played football in a colorless way like a plumber, a very great quarterback, but just boring. On the other side of the field, there was a guy named jo Joe Namath, my childhood hero. He wore $5,000 fur coats, did ads with pantyhose, uh, long hair, swinger all, he swung all night. He wrote a memoir called, I can't wait until tomorrow because I get better looking every day. <laughs> and so that was a shift in culture from one sort of person to another, from a very group oriented culture that said we're all in this together to a much more individualistic culture that says, I'm free to be myself. And this culture gave us some great things. It gave us the civil rights movement, it gave us the feminist movement. I don't think we could have had Silicon Valley 
and that rebel innovative atmosphere unless you had a creative individualist culture where you could rebel against organizations. And so it gave us a lot of great things. The problem is we've now had um, 40 years of it and we've kind of run out the string. And so we've seen a rise of narcissism. They have these tests called the narcissism test where it says, I'm gonna read you a bunch of statements. Does this apply to somebody like you? And their statements like, I find it easy to manipulate people because I'm so extraordinary. Or I love to look at my body. Or somebody should write a biography of me. The median narcissism score has gone up 30% in the last 20 years. We're 25th in the world in performance in math. If you ask people around the world, are you really good at math? We're number one in the world in thinking we're really good at math. <laughs> and with that has gone an increased desire for, for fame. Fame used to rank very low on what people wanted out of their life. Now if you ask college freshmen, it ranks second or third. Uh, and they have a test, they gave, asked college students, would you rather have a life that involves a lot of sex or a lot of fame? And by three to one, they'd rather have a lot of fame. And so when I go to college campuses, I say, listen, I'm on TV twice a week, I read a column in a prominent newspaper, I'm kind of famous, go with the sex, it's better. <laughs> um, and so that's uh, created a culture of individualism. And it's created three overlapping crises. The first is a crisis of isolation. If you ask Americans, are you lonely? 20 years ago, 20% said they were lonely. Now 40% say they're lonely. A generation ago, only 8% of Americans lived alone. Now about 35% do. In 1970, married couples entertained friends in their homes about 15 times a year. Now it's about eight times a year. Uh, only 8% of Americans say they have meaningful relationships with their neighbors. We have now have suicide rates at a 30-year high. Twice as many people die of suicide than die of car crashes. 45,000 people die of suicide. Uh, and suicide is just a proxy for loneliness. And 55,000 people a year die of opiate addiction. And opiate addiction is just slow-motion suicide. And so that's one crisis, a crisis of isolation. The second is a crisis of alienation, of losing trust with your institutions. In that we're all in this together, if you ask people, do you trust the institutions of your country, 70 and 80% said yes. Now it's down to 22%. If you ask people, do you trust your neighbors? Are the people around you trustworthy? It used to be 60% say, yeah, the people around me are trustworthy. Now it's down to 32% of Americans and 19% of millennials. The, lo the younger you get, the more distrust there is. Each generation is more distrusting than the one before. And that's not perception, that's reality. People are less trusting because their friends really are less trustworthy. And so we've got a social distrust problem, which is a, can be a terrible economic problem because it's very hard to do deals with people you distrust. And then the third crisis is a crisis of purpose, a crisis of meaning. It's kind of amazing to me that given all we've learned about the brain and, and mental health, that depression rates are rising, not falling. Mental health problems are rising, not falling. And I see it in my students at Yale. They get out of Yale and they're great kids but they suffer a crisis at 24, 25. They get fired from a job, they have a romantic breakup, and they call me and they're crushed. Nietzsche has a phrase, who, he who has a why to live for can endure anyhow. If you know why you're doing something, then you can survive the setbacks. But if you don't know what your purpose in life is, what your meaning in life, then the setbacks just are debilitating. And I, I've come to recognize that even in Yale, he's we're a pretty privileged group of people. And so we live in a culture that has left people naked and alone. And what do our evolutionary roots tell us when we're left naked and alone? They tell us to revert to tribe. And so if you get a culture that's moved from we're all in this together to I'm free to be myself, it now looks like we're moving to a culture that says revert to tribe. And you get negative polarization. So if you ask people, do you like your own political party? Most people say, nah, I don't really like my party. Do you hate the other party? Totally. <laughs> and so our, our, it's driven by tribal hatred. And the difference between community and tribe is community is built on love. You fall in love with a person, you fall in love with a place, and you, you don't begrudge people their other communities. My wife um, told me a story I love telling, uh, which is about how love is born. It was about a guy who, a lady who uh, was living in Houston, and she uh, went into uh, a hairdress. She was getting married. She was about to get married. She was, going to, she was a pianist, and she was going to come out here to San Francisco to marry the guy. And she thought she'd get her hair done before um, she moved out here. 
So she goes to get her hair done. She looks across the salon called Etude de Paris in Houston, and she sees a guy cutting somebody's hair. And she goes into the back room, puts on the gown, calls her mom, and says, I've just seen the man I'm actually going to marry. She gets her hair shampooed. She's sitting in the chair. She asks the guy's name. His name is David, the French pr pronunciation. He asks her story, and she says to him, well, I'm a concert pianist. I'm about to move to San Francisco to be with me, my fiance, but I won't do it if you'll marry me. And as David told the story to my wife, I looked down at my scissors and I never felt more free than I did at that instant. And he said, it's a deal. And they've been married for 17 years. So community starts with love. It doesn't always happen that fast, but it starts with love. But tribalism does not. Tribalism starts with hatred, with friend-enemy distinctions. It's us versus them. The tribal mentality is always a zero-sum mentality, a scarcity mindset we're scarce resources, we can't trust anybody, it's our group or their group, and the ends justify the means. And so if you look around our politics, if you look around a lot of culture, uh, you see that tribal mentality. I got to spend an afternoon with Steve Bannon not long ago, and it was, I enjoyed it actually, it was like being with Trotsky in 1905. Uh, it was like, he had this long 100 year theory, he was gonna take over the institutions, and Trump was a phase in that theory, but his main point was, you don't offer people community, we do. And tribal is a, is a form of community, not the kind I want to live under, but it is a form. And so I, for the Wall Street Journal I covered from 1990, 1990 to 1995, I covered nothing but good news. I covered the end of the Soviet Union, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the reunification of Germany, the Maastricht Treaty, Mandela coming out of prison in South Africa, the Oslo peace process in the Middle East. And in that last bit there, I covered one event that I barely paid attention to, and that was the Yugoslavian Civil War. And in retrospect, that was the most important event I covered, because the ethnic tribalism we began to see in Serbia and in Bosnia, that was what really determined the, la the next 25 years. And democracies have been shrinking ever since, ethnic nationalism has been rising ever since, and division and polarization across the world has been rising ever since. And so I've spent a lot of time recently thinking, well, how do countries turn around? Um, well, often they get, they're united by war. And I used to joke that, you know, it'd be nice if we got invaded by Canada, but now it looks like a real possibility, so I can't tell a joke. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but there, are, there, is, there is a model of countries turning around. And it happened in, in Britain between 1830 and 1848, and it happened here between uh, about 1990, 1890 and 1910. 1890, totally individualistic society, a lot of social breakdown, great wave of migration, a big economic transition, corrupt politics. It looked a little like today. And it, but the recovery happened in three phases. The first phase was uh, a religious phase, a religious revival. There was a very individualist ethos called social Darwinism, survival of the fittest. It was replaced by the social gospel movement that were all members of each other. Second phase was a civic renaissance. Between, in five years, in the 1890s, you had the creation of all these different civic organizations. The Boys and Girl Scouts, the Boys and Girls Clubs, the NAACP, labor unions, the Settlement House Movement, the Temperance Movement, the Environmental Movement. All these Americans said, all our institutions are not fit for the country we now live in. Let's get busy, let's create some organizations, and they did it. And then the third thing that happened was all those organizations looked around and said, you know, we're all part of the same project. And they became the progressive movement. And third, you had the political movement, Teddy Roosevelt. And so what you had was religion, civic, political, in that order. Now, you look around society today, uh, you know, I don't think it's going to be religious. I, there's just not evidence of a religious revival in this country. And I don't think it's political. Uh, politics is, is, if anything, the most lagging actor. But we are in the middle of a community and civic renaissance right now. And over, in places like this, like this organization, but all around the country, and especially over the last two or three years even, there's been an explosion in new civic groups. And they fall into a bunch of different buckets in my experience. They, there's like the, the, let's make our city great. And there's a, there's a book out by Jim and Deb Fallows talking about all the cities that are now just thriving this one's obvious, but frankly, you have the wind at your back economically. But some are not obvious. Fresno, California, uh, Eau Claire, Wisconsin, 
Allentown, Pennsylvania, Greenville, South Carolina, these are cities that are suddenly well-governed and are surging. The second is people creating community, creating bonding capital within communities. The third is people creating bridging capital, linking one community with another. I'm involved in a group in, in DC and I go to their house every Thursday night for dinner. Uh, and it's, it was hosted by a couple named David and Kathy. And they had a kid in the DC public schools and that kid had a friend who didn't, his mom was, had some drug and health issues, dad was split, so the kid had nothing to eat and no place to sleep. And so they said, well, James can stay with us. And so James started staying with them. And then James had a friend, and that kid had a friend, and that kid had a friend. And now when you go over to Kathy and David's house, there's mattresses all over the floor. 15 kids are staying there on any given night. And at dinners on Thursday nights, there are 25, 30 kids there. And I walk in the first place, first time I'm there about four years ago, and I reach out to shake one of the kids' hands, and he says, you know, we don't really shake hands here. We hug here. And so like I'm embraced in hugs every Thursday. They have a complete intolerance of social distance. For a middle-aged white guy, it's like, it's actually great. <laughs> I wouldn't lead the hugging, but I'm glad to be the recipient of the hugging. And I, I took a friend of mine there who was out, he used to work in LA doing community renewal in schools. And he's 70 or so, and he's often asked, what programs turn around lives? And he says, I've never seen a program turn around a life, only relationships turn around lives. And it's that kind of intimate relationship you see growing up on the local level again and again. And then you've got groups trying to heal economic divides. You've got groups trying to rediscover our sense of nation. And mostly what I see is groups, whether civic groups or companies, saying it's not enough just to use each other for utilitarian reasons. We want to create a thick organization out of this company, out of this civic group, out of this college. And I'm sure you've noticed this. There are some organizations or places you work and you pass through and you're not affected. But then there are some colleges you go to or organizations you're a part of and you're totally transformed. And so Marines, I can always tell somebody's a Marine, a Morehouse man, an Army Ranger, a Juilliard pianist, strengthening my college, University of Chicago, we're affected for life because somebody decided that my company or my organization is not going to be thin, I'm going to make it thick. And how do you make it thick? Well, they tend to have a distinct identity. They tend to have a physical location and they bring people together in cramped circumstances. They tend to have ritual meals over dinner tables. They tend to have collective rituals, shared tasks, clearly defined goals. They tend to go off in retreats where they sleep overnight so they can see each other after dinner and before the makeup's put on in the morning. They tend to involve music into their organizations because it's hard not to be close to somebody you've danced with. And so they have a label. And the creation of these thick organizations is the creation of community. And you see millennials more or less insisting on this wherever they go. Because as they all say, I want to bring my whole self to work. <laughs> and so what you see, especially among the millennials, is people perfectly designed to do this kind of bridging and this community building. And I've written this column called The Rise of the Amphibians. And I, I go around to a lot of colleges. And I'd notice that you'd meet a kid and she'd be half Costa Rican, half French, half Rwandan, half Vietnamese, all these weird combinations. Uh, and they, you find these people, often they would talk about how they didn't know quite where to place themselves because their identities were super mixed, super pluralistic. But they thrive in radically different environments. They're pluralism personified. They've mastered two or three or four or five different worlds. They have a concept which call, is called living on the edge of inside. In any organization, there's the core of the organization, and there's the outside of the organization. They live just on the edge of the inside, where they know about the organization, but they can communicate outside the organization. And that's a, a very creative place to be. And so they, they are human versions of bridging capital. And so out of that sort of civic renewal that I'm seeing around, and out of the, all these amphibian type personalities, I think we're on the verge or have the potential to have a verge that will sort of create a new movement to have a revival. And frankly, I spend my afternoons now at the Aspen Pro Institute, and our job, we've created a new project to do three things. To take the people who are doing local great stuff to lift up them up, make them famous, establish a social identity and inspire people, yeah, be like those people. Second, to synthesize their ethos into one sort of coherent belief system so you can be aware of what you actually believe. 
and third, to convene them. And if you look around how you change history, who are the change makers in society? Sadly, it's not op-ed columnists. It's people who create social movements that other people want to join, and then they'll all bend their energies to you. And shifts in culture happen, and they happen because people are extremely ingenious. History moves on the basis of what one historian called a ratchet, hatchet, pivot, ratchet. So you, the culture solves the problem, you ratchet upwards. But then it stops working, so you hatchet it up. And those hatchet moments are very tough to live through. 1968, 1848, 1932, today. But never underestimate human ingenuity. We'll figure it out. We are figuring it out. The solutions are all out there already. You pivot over and you ratchet upward. And so we'll figure it out. We will rebuild community as you guys are in this room. Thank you. Thank you, so David. close to you. It's community. <laughs> so I think it's fair to say that based on your conclusion, you are optimistic about America's path forward. As you look around the world, we see the rise of political authoritarianism and populist authoritarianism. Uh, how optimistic are you about the world? And how applicable is your theory of revival here to the world more broadly? Yeah, I, one of the things we were talking earlier, if you listen to people like me, um, you always get overly pessimistic. If you go back through pundits and nonfiction writers, it's always, oh, the decline of this and the decline of that. And that's partly because if you want to appear smart, it's best to be hypercritical. And if you want to get attention and sell books, be critical. But the reality is, if you go back over the history of all these books about how we're in decline, they're always wrong. And so until I'm proven correct, America always makes the adjustments because we have a very fluid society, we have a lot of energy, we have a lot of talented people coming here. And there are times when society sort of goes through transitions, but there hasn't been a time when that transition has led to decline. So I just think we're in a, a moment of transition, not a moment of decline. If, you, if we really saw a civil war, like 1968 almost, if we didn't have economic dynamism, which we have within 50 miles a year, if we didn't have with sort of managing the diversity problem in some ways. Uh, society is in decent shape. Our political system is, sucks, but everything else. Uh, and in my view, the shape of the culture and the shape of society is more important than the shape of your politics. Politics will figure itself out if you can get your society right. We're delighted to welcome you to the Bay Area. As Jim said at the beginning, uh, this is a, a tale of two regions. Uh, the Bay Area Council will shortly release its biannual economic profile, and unemployment set a low, the economy's doing great. Uh, but sometimes we get the feeling around here that the rest of the country may not understand us or like us very much. As you travel around the country, what are the perceptions of this region? Yeah. And what advice <laughs> would you have for us? Uh, the first, if you want to get advice on how to be popular, Talk to somebody who lives in Washington. Uh, like, <laughs> what do I know? Uh, I, no, I guess I, I would say um, it's been sh striking to me that, um, that t 15 years ago, I would say views of the valley were unalloyedly positive. Everybody wanted to live in the valley, and everybody wanted to work. It was like this miracle that was happening in our midst, and there was super appreciation. Now there has been a sharp slide in public opinion uh, over three things, I think. The first, it's not really tech, it's social media. The evidence has just become overwhelming that say you're a 15-year-old girl or boy, the more social media you consume, the more likely you are to be depressed. And the rise of suicides, the rise of depression correlates pretty well with the rise of the smartphone. So if social media is part of a problem, then that is a societal problem that people around the society recognize. The second is the perception that um, that some of it is done intentionally. Some of the addiction technologies to suck people in and keep people reading and to keep people scrolling and to keep people clicking is done intentionally. And so suddenly there's been a little hint of malevolence. And third, uh, just the bigness of the, especially the big companies. Uh, and this is a country that is renegotiating its position of power. Uh, and mostly that's a good thing. When I go around these college campuses, one of the things I notice is we, every conversation ends up as 
how do you organize power? Uh, because there are scenes every institution of your life fail if you're a millennial or younger. And I notice in their social movements, like in my social movements as sort of a super young boomer, it's my social movements that I believed in were masses of people led by a famous person at the top. Martin Luther King, Gloria Steinem, Ralph Nader, whatever, Ronald Reagan. Their social movements are, have no leaders and are radically decentralized. Me Too, Black Lives Matter, Tea Party, uh, alt-right. And so they distrust bigness to a great degree. Uh, and so out of those three things, there is a great danger that people, especially in the tech industry, um, will be seen as the new tobacco industry or the new NFL. A, an NFL, more like the NFL with great power and great promise and great popularity, but also in a dangerous spot. And I begin to see tech people recognizing this and trying to police themselves, but it seems to me that it's, they're in an interesting transition point. You spoke movingly a few minutes ago about the potential for millennials to, to change the world and in particular uh, revive communities as you go ahead. Um, what advice would you have for millennials as they embark and progress on that yeah. journey? Well, the first thing is I ask them, um, who are your heroes? And that always evokes a long period of silence because they have trouble thinking of them. Uh, and eventually somebody will say Pope Francis and then somebody else will say Ellen DeGeneres. So those are the two. Um, and the second thing is they just talk about how institutions have failed them. Uh, and so they do want to create community. I think the, the communities that they're building are so far not scaling. And it may be because they all want to be leaders and they don't want to just be part of like the Boy Scouts went national automatically and the Girl Scouts and the Boys and Girls Clubs, a lot of those mentorship moments, and they swept the country. We're somehow not doing that. And then the final thing I'll tell them I tell them is, um, well, the first thing I tell them is the most important decision you're going to make in life is, mar is who you marry. So every course you take in college should be about marriage, the psychology of marriage, the neuroscience of marriage, the sociology of marriage. <laughs> they don't listen to me. They, one of them said, well, she said, marriage is just a box that'll come in the mail when I'm 35. I'm not thinking about it right now, but they're wrong about that. Uh, but the final thing I'd say is, it's super apolitical generation, I get it. Politics is very unpleasant these days, but people who don't care about politics, only people who are privileged cannot care about politics. Because if you live in a society where you don't know if you're gonna get shot or who you have to bribe, you have to care about politics. And you can get a lot right in the society, you can do a lot of community organizations. There are 14,000 NGOs in Haiti, I'm sure most of them are doing great work, but unless you get the governance right, there's only so much you can do in a society. And so uh, I try to counsel them to think about life in politics because the numbers, the dollars, and then just the effect you can have are just so much bigger than anything else. I have a friend who worked in the Bush administration who helped found this, this program called PEPFAR, which is our HIV program in Africa. That guy helped save 13 million lives. Where else are you gonna do that? And so I try to counsel them to go into politics. This is a... Uh a gathering convened by a group of businesses and uh, part of a country renegotiating its deal with power is rethinking the role of big business. Mm -hmm. What advice would you have for big businesses? Yeah. I will say the first thing, I mentioned this, you know, I, I'm on the road every week somewhere and one of the first things I ask when I get to a town is do the main employers, do their owners live here? Because it's super evident when they do. So you go to Grand Rapids, Michigan, which happens to have four big furniture firms, and the owners all live there, and they've got a big supermarket firm that's there, and this, the downtown is just booming because the family foundations and everything else, they've really committed to the community, and they've just put back. Uh, and so it's just super important to A, take the wealth that you get, you get and just pour it back into a local region. Two, uh, I'm, one of my mentors was Milton Friedman. And he preached something that I think was wrong, which is that all you should share, care about is shareholder value, just focus on shareholder value. And I think that as, talk about creating thin organizations. I think that obviously you have to care about shareholder value, but thinking only about shareholder value, I think it perversely is, is hurts shareholder value because you lose that sense of mission and purpose that any soul-filled creature wants to live for. 
And so moving beyond that and having a sense of, of what is this community is for. Um, and then the final thing I'd say is never underestimate the importance of place. Just, we don't, we, a lot of our property programs, we don't know what works. And so you just have to flood the zone. And you pick a spot and you throw everything you have at it. And you hope mysteriously you'll be able to create some sort of positive dynamic that you will never understand. I'm a big Bruce Springsteen fan. And I was in um, Madrid going to a Springsteen concert. And Springsteen has his fourth album was called Darkness on the Edge of Town. And it's about his life in central New Jersey. And he's got all the, the icons of that location. Uh, the Stone Pony's a bar, Highway 9 is a highway. And all these kids in Madrid have these t-shirts, the Stone Pony Highway 9. And you know, he, they were, I saw 65,000 kids singing, I was born in the USA, I was born in the USA. I felt like saying, no, you weren't. None of you were born in the USA. <laughs> but if you, if you have a strong sense of the particular place you are in with a particular history and you invest in that story, then you have a civic revival. And if you don't have that particular story of a place, it's very hard to recreate it. For uh, my final question, I'd like to go to my favorite David Brooks column. I'm sure many of us have one. This is from three years ago. And David wrote uh, quite movingly about uh, people who have something that he calls dispositional gratitude. And I quote, uh, they may have big ambitions, but they have preserved the joy of small anticipations. People with dispositional gratitude take nothing for granted. They take a beginner's thrill at a word of praise, at another's good performance, or at each sunny day. David, what are you grateful for? <laughs> Grateful to be here. I mean, we, we all won the lottery, <laughs> uh, all of us in this room. So I'm, I'm grateful for that, but mostly I just want to emphasize how cultivating gratitude in any circumstance. I wrote that column because I noticed I sometimes get, I get to stay in really nice hotels and sometimes just to comfort inns or something like that. And I realized I'm happier to comfort in because when I'm staying at a Four Seasons, my expectations are so high. When they're not met, I'm pissed off. <laughs> and so a lot of his gratitude is about expectations. But second, people, some people just go out and look to be grateful. The, the great marriage expert is a guy named John Gottman. And he says, a, a conver any relationship, a marriage or any other relationship, is a series of conversational bi bids. So I say to you, oh, it's a lovely day. You can either respond toward me, which is saying, oh yeah, that's, thank you for pointing that out. Or you can respond against me. Do you mind, I'm doing something else. Or you can just grunt and not respond at all. And his rule is that in any marriage, there should be five toward bids for every one away bid. Mm. And he said the relationship masters go out of their way looking for ways to give a toward bid. Thank you for the doing the dishes. Thank you for uh, being such a wonderful person. Thank you for asking good questions. And they're actively trying to go those toward bids. And they, they're scanning the horizons for opportunities to be grateful. And the people who have that, they just have a an incandescent, I meet these people like once a month. The, some people just glow with an inner light. They just have that joy. And their lives are, are marked by gratitude. David, we are grateful for an insightful and thought-provoking hour. Thank you for being with us. Thank you.